Are you looking to improve employee engagement and retention? Do you struggle with decisions on who to hire or who to promote? I have an amazing opportunity for a forward-thinking, purpose-led, people-first organisation to work with me on the first pilot Happier at Work programme for corporates. The programme is entirely science-backed and you will have tangible outcomes in relation to employee engagement, retention, performance and productivity. The programme is aimed at people leaders with responsibility for hiring and promotion decisions. If this sounds like you, please get in touch at Aoife at happieratwork.ie. That's A-O-I-F-E at happieratwork.ie. You're listening to the Happier at Work podcast. I'm your host, Aoife O'Brien. This is the podcast for leaders who put people first. The podcast covers four broad themes, engagement and belonging, performance and productivity, leadership equity, and the future of work. Everything to do with the Happier at Work podcast relates to employee retention. You can find out more at happieratwork.ie. A nine to five is not designed for people who have children. And now that you know something, then you need to do better. You know, uh, it's fine at the time. And then once it changes, you need to adapt. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Happier at Work podcast. Today's topic is something I've been meaning to talk about for quite some time and I'm delighted to have my my guest today, Sarah Courtney from Sarah Courtney Coaching and she supports parents to thrive in the workplace. Sarah is a mum, a coach, a champion of supporting parents who want to remain in the workplace. She's also a coach trainer with the Irish Life Coach Institute. And her priorities are to work flexibly, doing work that she loves, that fits in with family life. She has the privilege of working with incredible women and men and highly supportive employers. Workplaces are changing rapidly and there are many progressive employers who want to proactively support their staff as they transition back to work after becoming parents. They want to retain experienced, talented, committed people to lead their businesses. Her career has been in the corporate world of banking, software and ed tech, so she understands the challenges and pressures facing working parents, but she also relates to the buzz and the joy that work can bring. Smart employers provide their teams with support and choice so that they continue to step into their careers once they become parents. She is there to simply help them keep them on track. I know you are going to absolutely love today's episode of the podcast. We cover uh, quite a lot of ground. Maybe that's a kind of usual behaviour for me, but we do get into a lot of different aspects, a lot of different nuances, a lot of different details about supporting parents, but not just parents. If anyone has had a transition or if anyone has had a period of absence or if someone is managing people who are parents at work and and trying to be able to manage that and and as companies evolve and grow, how to actually manage that as well. So we cover a lot of topics in relation to that. And I really hope you enjoy today's episode. Do stick around for the end where I summarise the key points. And I would love if you could get involved in the conversation on social media, whether on LinkedIn, on Instagram. So connect with me, Aoife O'Brien, that's A-O-I-F-E, O apostrophe B-R-I-E-N. And I was delivering a in-person for the first time in two years uh, talk the other day. It was in the UK and people were kind of a little bit confused about how to say my name um, because it starts with an A and it ends with an E. But I, what I always say to people is read it backwards. So, you know, it's pronounced Efa, but it starts with A and it ends with E. Sarah, you are so welcome to the Happy Art Work podcast. I'm delighted to have you as my guest. We've been kind of maybe on each other's radars for the last few months, uh, certainly. And I am dying to have this conversation with you because a lovely listener of mine reached out directly and asked specifically for this, uh, this topic. And this topic has been in the back of my mind for a long time now. I just haven't addressed it yet. So I'm so delighted to have you as my guest today. Do you want to tell people a little bit more about who you are, what you do and how you got into what you're doing. Yeah, thanks Aoife. Lovely to be here and delighted we are getting to have this this conversation and your listener is not alone. There's a lot of people looking for help and advice and just a sounding board maybe on um, what they're going through. So, um, So I qualified as a coach in 2013 and I knew very quickly that I wanted to support parents at work. 
Um, so I just had my first baby and there's loads of support and rightly so for all things baby. So there was, you know, breastfeeding or weaning or um, baby massage or baby music and all these lovely things, but next to nothing for the parent and specifically the mother and how it would inevitably impact her career. Um, and I had been working in HR and it, you know, sadly, it did take me having a child and stepping into those shoes to realize that we needed as a profession to be doing more for parents returning after whatever family leave absence they'd taken. Um, and that businesses, you know, would really benefit from supporting their people through a time of massive transition. So I went and set up this business almost accidentally, never really planned to be a business owner. Um, but I just really much like myself, it. Sarah. <laughs> I, think, well, I think a lot of us stumble, stumble into this. Yeah. It just sort of grows arms and legs. Yeah. Um, but I just felt that there was something to be done. And, and happily, it's just growing and growing all the time. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. No, it's such I think it's such. A, an opportunity, such a problem for businesses as well. And like we, we kind of spoke briefly before um, before we started recording about this idea of like if businesses only knew how much it was actually costing them in terms of, you know, maybe lost productivity from people not being able to or not feeling like they belong when they go back when they're during that kind of transition period. But also that it's not just about women returning after a period of time or or, or maternity specific, I suppose, is is, um, is where I'm going with that, because I don't have kids myself, but I have had periods of time where I've been not working for kind of over a year at one point uh, and then returning into the workplace without really thinking twice about it, just thinking, oh, just get on with it without really thinking now I need to get back into the routine of actually working and delivering to expectations and delivering objectives, all of that kind of stuff that you sort of forget, you know, and um, and the technology, of course, as well. Like, we, you know, this it was around the time that instant messenger had just come about. And I was like, wow, instant messenger, isn't this amazing <laughs> new technological advancement, you know? Um, so, yeah, I suppose like the the undertone of this entire conversation is it's not just about women returning to work. It could be men. It could be people returning from illness. It could be any sort of period of absence from work. And it doesn't have to be a year. It can be five years or six years. It could be eight years or 10 years. Like, I think there's a huge opportunity. And um, in one of the previous episodes, actually, we talked about this. It was basically an untapped talent pool, essentially, of people who are currently not working, who have amazing, fantastic skills, but don't maybe, maybe they sell themselves short slightly or they don't see that there's opportunities for them to get back into work or they don't have the confidence to go back into work, you know. Um, so like so much that we could talk about on this topic. Yeah, and, and you're right. You know, the labelling is in what I do is maternity, paternity, um, but it's just people taking absence from work and, and helping them with that transition back. And that, as you say, could be a sick leave. It could be a sabbatical. It could be, you know, somebody who took a few years out for caring responsibilities and, um, you know, be that elder care. So it, this, as you say, there's just a huge opportunity for businesses to um, realise that uh, staff need support when there's transition. And it can be some really simple things. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be overly complex. It doesn't have to be high budget. But it's the messaging to people that we value you, we care, we're mm. hearing you. It's maybe not one size fits all. It's a specific conversation. Um, but there's just so much that can be done. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to Aoife today um, was to share that it's not all doom and gloom, you know, yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. mums returning to work. There's <laughs> loads and loads of people that are finding their rhythm again and really enjoying it and, and thriving. Yeah, um, yeah. I do think we do. You know, it's easier to share the horror stories sometimes. Um, but there's a balance again. There's, there's some awesome stuff happening as well. Yeah, no, that's it. And I would love to hear more about the those kind of positive stories. But maybe let's have a, a, a look, first of all, at what some of the problems are that face organisations. And, and like I said, I mean, my background is in research and data. I love stats of numbers and I don't know if something exists to say this is the impact of 
a, you know, lost productivity or um, for, for people, for managers, for businesses that handled those transitions poorly, you know, and I know certainly like from my own personal experience and, you know, feeling a little bit emotional now. But when I did um, return to work after, I think it was like a year and three or four months and I had spent that time traveling and I came back to the workplace, didn't really consider what that impact was of me not being working for a year and a half. Mm. I, I kind of factored in, I had all of this fantastic global experience that should be valued in the organisation. But actually, the, um, the transition was probably harder than I gave myself credit for. And it was more about the transition than my own performance. But my own performance was being called into question, which then made me doubt my own abilities, which was kind of almost like a spiral. Um, and that was really, really tough for me because I've always been the kind of person who wants to do really, really well at work. And having that type of feedback coming back to me, but without the context, without understanding what was going on, mm -hmm. I think that was really tough. And I'm sure it's it's similar, if not worse, for, for people who are coming back from maternity leave when they've had this massive life transition or for people who ha who are returning after years and years of being out of the workplace. Uh, DCU did some research a few years back, so that might be one for you to take a look at. Brilliant, yeah, um, I'll check that out. And they did, uh, you know, what impacted women's returns? It's a very specific sort of set of questions, but a really powerful research. And I'm sure they've actually probably expanded on it since then. Yeah. And now that you're saying that, because I, I did my master's at DCU and I'm wondering, I think, it probably didn't make the connection at the time or it wasn't really that interested because I didn't have kids myself, but that might have been actually two of my lecturers. So I can reach out to them and, and just yeah. kind of get some proper research around that. Um, yeah, yeah, happy it, to it, share it with listeners as well. It's really powerful and really powerful for employers to hear it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the other thing is that um, sometimes it's, it's nuanced with women returning and then leaving or not having a good experience they're not necessarily communicating that yeah. because they don't want to be labeled or they don't want to admit that it's a struggle or be seen as different and there are some women leaving organizations without ever sharing that and like that Aoife they're bringing with them that maybe dip in confidence because it was a tough return and they thought well I can't hack it and I'll go somewhere else and maybe I'll take a, a role below what I used to be doing. Yeah. And then we're feeding gender pay gap issues and it goes on and on and on and it does spiral. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. think for want of a little bit of support, you know, a lot of these things could be, you know, kind of avoided. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's all anecdotal and I love that mm. the idea, well, as in, I love the that you're saying, like, people might end up leaving if they don't feel and they're not going to voice up. And it's similar, like I talk about imposter syndrome a lot, um, but that's a similar thing that like it's an extreme case, but sometimes people leave because they feel like an imposter. They don't want to be found out. They feel like they're in above their head. And rather than admit to those feelings and like actually verbalise that they're, that they're feeling like that, they would just rather leave and either go to another organisation at that same level or t like you say, take that kind of step down and that feeds into maybe we'll get to talk about this later the the gender pay gap because that's going to be a huge topic in the coming years when people have to actually legally report on what their gender pay gap is and I know there are some organizations who are ahead of the curve who are doing it already but that's you know, one of the huge contributing factors is this kind of break that women typically have and they don't have that support in transitioning back to work. They don't see the opportunities. Maybe they don't see the role models in those more senior roles and they feel that they can't do it themselves or that they're focused on other things, you know. And that's a great point about the role modelling because yeah. you have younger women who aren't quite at that point yet yeah. quietly watching. Yes. And they're thinking, is this the type of team or company that is family friendly, that can meet what my future needs will be? They're just gently watching it. And if they see that, look, this is a tough place or I don't see role models doing it the way I think I would like in my life, mm. you would be amazed what decisions are getting made. And they're definitely not communicating that out. They're just doing it quietly to themselves and they know they're horrible elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and also, you've got to remember that. You know, women having children are, you know, they're 30s, 40s. These are really valuable, talented women. 
Um, so it does make sense that you would want to keep huge, a huge amount of experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, interestingly, and this is kind of a slight aside, but I did post on LinkedIn yesterday about uh, any research that has been conducted in Ireland on the impact specifically of the pandemic in Ireland uh, in relation to the Great Resignation, in relation to kind of like really I didn't explicitly say this in the post but women at work because of the research that's been done by McKinsey and um, someone else together they, they came together and they did some research and found that in the United States 25% of women were looking to leave during the pandemic because the pressures of homeschooling of caring responsibilities all of this kind of stuff and it impacted on women way more than it impacted on men um and so there were some specific demographics that i wanted to understand around that for ireland now i've seen some replies come through for that but i think none of them are very specific to exactly what it is i'm looking for so maybe i'll carry out that research myself you know yeah it'd be amazing and and i'm conscious that in terms of people listening to this if they're in the States versus they're in Europe, they're going to have a very different experience because of maternity or, you know, family legislation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, imagine going back to work with a 10 week old, uh, you know, in a, in a pandemic. Yeah. I'm amazed that the numbers are low in, that, in the sense of people who would want to do something else. It just, it sounds appalling. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, we're very privileged in Ireland, you know, where we are both that, there are protective laws for parents wanting to take leave and that those laws are trying to be more inclusive of the other parent in the mix, you know, not just the the mum giving birth, um, that those laws are extending to the partners and dads, um, however way you've made your family. Um, So I'm conscious that people's lenses are very different depending on in the world where they are. And interestingly, um, I was working with a German client and one of the pieces there was culturally they can take up to three years and yeah i think it's similar in scandinavia i have an idea that it's yeah it it, it, it extends it out there's options to extend and the pressure for her was um what if i don't want to oh what if i don't want to take the full three years yeah interesting yeah because culturally it's well that's what you do but actually, specifically for each person, they're going to react differently. And for her, her professional identity was a huge part of her life. And she was looking further down the road and thinking, if I do a three year gap on my CV, you know, where does that leave me? Um, so it, it's funny because, you know, you think oh, these these laws are great and this is amazing. And, and but it comes down to choice, yeah. you know, let let parents make choices that are you know, in line with what they're trying to build in their lives, um, that it's not a one size fits all. Yeah, yeah. I like that idea that it, and you mentioned that earlier that it's not a one size fits all. And I think that's the case with a lot of things. You know, the research that I did as part of my dissertation was all centering around needs and our needs at work. And we have these basic psychological needs, which it was kind of the focus area, if you like, but also in the secondary research that I conducted, it was like, well, we have all of these other needs as well that need to be met. So we have these universal needs that everyone has, but then there's additional needs that need to be met. And maybe one of those is, like you said earlier, it's women who are a bit younger, but thinking into the future, like I might have a family. And is this the kind of organisation that supports families? And are there role models of people who are um, you know, succeeding at this organisation and having a family at the same time. Exactly. And those role models are so powerful. You know, policy is one thing, but when you see it being lived and you see senior people at all levels and all types of areas within the business are uh, firstly there, you know, in terms of gender balance, uh, but also taking, you know, an extended paternity leave or the dads doing, you know, job shares or, or part time or, or whatever it might be, that they're living what they say they do in policy. It's phenomenally attractive yeah. to potential candidates. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is, you know, kind of going back to the point that you made earlier is how will you attract and retain you know, that the cohort of people who want to have families and let's not just focus on women, it's it's mm-hmm. men as well. And if you're providing those opportunities, that's brilliant. Now, um, there was something actually, I'm in a, a HR group on Facebook and one of the, you know, this this guy posted something and it was, a, he said, oh, I'm just kind of trying to stir the pot a little bit here, but this is very US based, US focused. And, and he said that Google were trying to attract 
a specific talent pool and they were supporting with uh, extended leave, you know, compared to what the standard is in, in the States. Now, in the way that he was stirring the pot, it was like, well, what does that mean for smaller businesses who can't really afford to do that? And, you know, it really got me thinking. And I mean, the debate between what people were saying and how, well, it's, is that really fair on people who don't have kids as well? So, I mean, like it, it went down loads and loads of rabbit holes, but it does kind of, I suppose, beg an important question that, OK, if these large global organisations can do that, then is it at the expense of these smaller or medium sized businesses that can't necessarily afford to do that in terms of their overheads, but they want to retain a, a really great talent pool as well. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think it's just not binary. It's not either we can or we can't. There are lots of small supports you can do in the middle ground that any employer can do. Yeah, That's budget free. You can have a culture that is friendly and open and honest. And I have to collect my kid because, you know, they're sick and crash. And there's no eye rolling. You know, it's supportive. Um, there's some very basic things even that any employer can do regardless of size or budget. Um, but I do believe that organizations that have the ability, that are leaders, um, you know, have a responsibility to do that. And it's yeah. why I only work directly with employers. I don't work with individual people. Um, I work directly with employers who want to support their working parents because I think they have a responsibility to be the leaders in the space um, and to provide that support. Uh, and I think you know, an argument of, but not everybody can, is not a reason not to do something. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. If, if oh, it, absolutely. If it's yeah. and it makes sense and it's possible, why would you not for those who can? And then for those who can't provide, you know, six months paid paternity leave, um, what else could they do? What flexible working arrangements would be available? Uh, we saw in the pandemic massive changes in ways of working. Yeah. Lots from employers who were very flexible to begin with and lots from employers who, who never had anything other than a standard nine to whatever yeah. office based. And all of a sudden they could. Um, so a bit of creativity, you know, is, is, is useful. Yeah. And to me, that is the future of work. There's no more nine to five. There is you can work in the morning if that suits you. Um, you know, and, and I've talked before about this idea of asynchronous communication. Like you don't have to be live with people. You don't have to have instant messages. You don't have to be available on Slack or at least you can use Slack for asynchronous mm -hmm. that people can follow up on specific projects straight into Slack or over email. It doesn't have to be immediate conversations. Um, but I, I loved as well, Sarah, what you said about this idea of, well, A, the response responsibility of, of large organisations to show people the way and to show this is how things are done, because what I can see with them is, go, you know, kind of backing up your point of this culture, like it's not just about the policies, it's about creating this culture where everyone is included. And, you know, I'm a huge proponent of that, like a huge chunk of the research that I did focused on the values of the organization and, and, you know, making sure that they're lived. I loved what you said about like, it's not just the policy that we have. It's <laughs> like people can actually see this being lived. And the same applies to values in an organization. It's not just saying like, these are our values. It's behaving in certain ways that uphold those values within the organization. And like for me, if you find somewhere to work, if you're working in an organization where you feel like you belong, where you feel like your values are aligned, where you feel the behavior of the people in that organization reflects really strongly with how you believe that people should behave in an organization. And it's not the same for everyone. So my values could be different to your values, Sarah, and therefore we might not fit in in the same mm -hmm. organization. But um, yeah, I think that it's really important to factor those elements in as well when making decisions about like yeah. where is the, the best place to work so and, and yeah. I think energy is not you know endless and if you're distracted by can I fit conflict and <laughs> yeah conflict yeah if, if this is a it is always going to be a difficult conversation at work when something happens that I cannot be you know in an office or online or attend a meeting it's always going to be conflict i think that's energy sapping yeah and it and it, it's a distraction away from what you're actually there to do which is probably leading teams or being responsible for budgets or innovation or much more interesting things yeah. than than you know can i can i be here at a certain time yeah. or, you know i think we have to move past that um 
you know, let's be adults, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's really good. Like the whole idea, I think a conflict just takes up so much of your time at work. If you're worried about something, if you're complaining about someone else, you know, it it does. You spend, I think, more time thinking about that and trying to manage it and mitigate it. And, you know, <laughs> I know certainly from past experience, just talking about things made it worse. So when, <laughs> you know, when people who I was, uh, let's say, complaining about my work situation to on a daily basis, when they left the organisation, it was like, now I have no one to complain to. <laughs> And that my situation miraculously improved. Yeah, um, it was. Well, what, yeah. what you focus on grows. Exactly. So if you're focusing on conflict, yeah, how much I hate it working here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely, a hundred percent. You know, and it's so. If there's someone listening who's just complaining about their work situation every day, either do something about it or stop complaining. Well, um, well I heard a great line: "In every complaint, there's a wish." Yes. And I think flip it. If you're complaining, actually just be gentle and honest with yourself and, and ask, what is my wish in this? What me need of not being met? Um, what We're going would back I to needs like again to... and well, just a meeting of needs that work. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. of it is linked. Yeah. You know, if something will be better, which isn't so and so leaves, you know, if something was better in the scenario that I am responsible for. Yeah. Um, what am I willing to change in myself to get a better outcome? Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I think that piece of the complaint is easy and human and we all do it. But at some point you have to draw a line in the sand and go, look, what's the wish in this? What, what am I wishing was different? Yeah. Yeah. So before we move on to kind of more of the positive stories, there is something I wanted to pick up on mm -hmm. um, that you you said. I was kind of thinking of it and then and then you said it. So um that's great. <laughs> um, you said something about it. Let's just move away from this time thing where like I'm not available at certain times and stuff like that. Now, I have heard people talking to me about be feeling deliberately excluded because they know they have to like the, the team knows they have to pick up their kids at a certain time or they're not available after a certain time because it's bedtime or things like this. And yet they still plan meetings for that time. So the individual feels deliberately like they're being excluded, that this is not a family friendly place, that it's it's kind of in those situations, it was a, a woman and it was a male kind of dominated industry, male dominated team and the senior leadership. So I'd love to get your thoughts on how to handle a situation like that. Or, or is that something that you know, happens with your clients? Yeah, you know, everyone has bias. Um, we just had International Women's Day recently, Break the Bias was the theme. And a lot of companies are doing practices that they've always done. Yeah. So we always had that meeting at this time, or we always did this away day off site on a Saturday, or, you know, they've just done things and there's been no problem. And that's how they've done it. Um, and they can't see it from the lens of maybe somebody else. So in an ideal world, you would have a culture of open communication where somebody could share, uh, not from a, hey, this is unfair, but is there another option we can do here? Um, what would be a more inclusive way that we can all be involved? Because I'm not trying to create an obstacle. I'm trying to team myself up for success. Yeah. Um, this is not to be awkward and say I have a hard stop of fire, but I never, you know, got to get yeah. online again after that. This is, I want to be involved in this. It's important. It means something to me. Um, how can we make it so that we're all included? Yeah. Um, so, so it's, you know, think of it like tennis, you know, you're responsible for a certain portion and they're responsible for another portion. Uh, but you must communicate what is going on for you. If it's just worry in your head and you're not saying it outwardly in a way that is constructive and confident, um, then it's just in your head and they don't necessarily know or they know and you haven't said it's a problem. Yeah. And I think this you've got to communicate it. Th this goes back to one of the earlier points that you made about that communication and actually letting people know that you're struggling or letting people know that things are not going as smoothly as you had anticipated. But then extending that to this, you know, c but hopefully you're in that safe environment where you can have that open communication, where it is OK to actually speak up. And for me, this this is it's, you know, I've spoken about psycholo psychological safety multiple times on the podcast. There's different perspectives on this. I still believe that it, that comes from the top. You have to manage psychological safety from the top of the organisation that, that the leaders are creating an environment where it's OK for people to speak up, even if they don't agree with what's being said, that, that it's it's OK to actually say I'm struggling. It's OK to say that's not work. You know, that's not 
um, that time doesn't suit me for that meeting. I know we've always done it at that time, but actually, you know, I loved what you said, like team myself up for success. I want you mm-hmm. to enable me to be successful. I want you to empower me to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it's about. And you're right. It has to come from the top and filter it out. Yeah. You know, but again, it's not just what we say, it's what we do. Yes. So if if our values are, you know, we are an inclusive, family friendly workforce, but we have meetings at 8 a.m. or 6 p.m., then you have to make sure things are in alignment. You know, is what you say you want to be or, or are your actions in line with that? Yeah. Or are they moving you away from that? Yeah. And it's a little bit of honesty and a little bit of ability to go to know something. We could just be a bit better. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be some drastic cultural change, but there's probably a small few tweaks we could make that would just send out that ripple effect of we hear you and we want to respond within, you know, the, the resources that we have. Yeah, I love that. The, the the listening part, like listening for what people actually want, I think is really important. And, I, and especially as we're transitioning to this new way of working, the future of work is already here in my mind, you know, if we're working hybrid, if we're working remote. A, a lot of organizations that I've worked with have been looking outside of themselves to see, well, you know, what are other people doing and what can we learn from other people? That's not what it's about. It's about listening to the people in your own organization and meeting their needs and, and figuring out what they want. And, and you know, again, this has come up on the podcast before. But you're not going to please everybody. You know, it's it's you can t- try and take as much of a tailored approach, a- approach as you can. But some people are going to be. Uh, I was going to use the bad word there and I'm like, I'm not sure <laughs> I'm allowed to use a bad word on my own podcast. But like some people are going to be pissed off, basically, you know, so. You can never please everybody, but you can listen to everybody. Yeah. And you can say, I hear you. This yeah. is what we can do. Yeah. And you can t- this is it. It's not just about listening. It's about mm-hmm. taking action. Mm-hmm. And the actions may not please everyone, yeah. but it's the fact that you've listened and that yeah. you're taking action on the back of what people exactly. have fed back to mm-hmm. show them that their voice is actually important, that they have yeah. a say in yeah. how they approach work. I always say that to employers, be careful of a survey. You know, if you, if you ask the question, you're going to have to listen to the answer. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, So Sarah, maybe now it's time to move on to the positive aspects. I'm dying to hear about some of the the kind of good news stories that you have before we wrap things up today. Yeah, look, uh, it's important, I think, to, you know, in in that sense of what we focus on grows. I think it's important to know that there can be really gorgeous returns to work after maternity leave. There can be really happy, um, proactive times after this milestone in your life and I work with women who are getting promoted on maternity leave Mm -hmm. who are coming back to really supportive teams who are co-creating that return with their manager and it's it's mutual it's together it's step and step Um, they are thriving when they're back you know, I hear this all the time and and my lens, I suppose, is different to maybe others in that I work with companies who really want to support their parents. And so they are doing the best that, that, that can be done for those people. But it's not one or two. It's loads and loads. And there is this narrative of mommy guilt and working mother and these labels that we attach that I just think are so unhelpful because they make you think, well, that's meant to happen for me. Um, You know, I I work, I'm in paid work. I'm also a full-time mother. You know, I I don't consider myself a part-time mother because I have a job. It's a 24-7 job. It's 24-7. They were up in the night. Like, I um, I just think this language is unhelpful and it does pit us against dads or non-parents or other um, and it's unhelpful I think organizations support people and people can have a diverse set of experiences in an organization but the men and women that I support loads of them are having really good returns because of what was done months or years ago in terms of culture in a company, in terms of getting ahead of what's coming down the line. I used to work before I was a coach, I used to work in a company and no one had kids. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they evolved because people started growing up and and kids kids arrived on the scene. And so that company didn't have anything, you know, beforehand, but it grew. 
yeah. it evolves. You know, no one's expecting a company to do everything perfectly all the time. But that listening piece allows you to evolve. That ability to hear different voices from different levels, from different types of people, um, lets you think, look, what could we build here? And again, it's very often not about budget so much as inclusivity. Yeah. And not putting pressure on people to fit a certain box or a label. Uh, but there are loads of returns um, that are, are so positive and careers that really do continue. Um, and I just think it's important to say that so that women don't think this is going to be awful because, you know, that's what I heard from somebody. So it must be true. Yeah. When I talk about values and inclusivity and culture fit, like really what I'm focusing on is that your values align with the values of the organisation and that those are being lived in the organisation, that they're not just being talked about. It's not just saying these are our values. But beyond that, it's this diversity of thought, which I think is really important. And there, there's an example that springs to mind is um, the when they were bringing out the new iPhone and they had the health tracker app and they neglected to include period trackers on it because there weren't any women in the room who were talking about what should be on this health tracker. What kind of things do women track on a regular basis? Yeah. You know, um, so it's important to, to reflect your customers at those kind of senior decision making um, uh, discussions, you know, to make sure that everyone, all ground is covered and bringing that diverse thinking and challenging how things are currently done, I think. But that book, Invisible Women, oh, uh, yeah. Carolyn Crowder Press, I mean, there are multiple examples of where uh, what one cohort of people see as obvious uh, doesn't get built into design. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, because they're not in the decision making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many times have we seen that in our own country, in other countries, in different businesses where things don't work for a lot of people in that organization? Yeah, yeah. You know, a nine to five is not designed for people who have children, uh, who are have caring responsibility. This is not what work was set up for because women weren't. It was a marriage ban. My mother had to give up work. She didn't even have children. She was just engaged or yeah. something. <laughs> Absolutely crazy stuff. Same, yeah, same with my mum. And she she posted as well about my granny on um, International Women's Day. Actually, she shared about um, the experience my granny had and and all of the stuff she did. And she went and she um, she got her master's and she still wasn't able to work because of the marriage ban. And, you know, <laughs> she did voluntary work instead of being able to get paid work. Like Incredible. it was all crazy. And if you think that that's just a, you know, a generation ago, essentially. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the blink of an eye. So we have to, I think as women, we have to remember that the structures weren't necessarily designed for our lives. Mm. And now that you know something, then you need to do better. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, it's fine at the time. And then once it changes, yeah. you need to adapt. Is that um, Maya Angelou, does she say that? She's like... Um, when uh, when you know better when you know better do better basically yeah. Yeah. yeah so do do your best and when you know better do better yeah and if you say you want a, a, an inclusive and we're talking about gender a lot and there's a lot more elements of diversity than that yeah absolutely um, yeah. and if that's what you want and when you know I mean going back to the research and data we know diverse workforces are more productive they're making yeah. more money yeah you know? exactly yeah um, same as happier working environments like they um, they just make yeah. more money basically happier people and I, I will say this to clients when i'm when i'm starting out and we're talking about are we good at work together and it's like look this isn't rocket science happy people stay in your in your company yeah. and they work really well because the, these are talented professional people yeah. they're not they're not going in for a paycheck they're not going in to tick a box yeah they love what they do exactly um, yeah they just need a little bit of an arm around um to go right you can continue you know and you've had you know a baby or two and that's not going to knock you of course loads loads more that we want from you we want your talent we want your thoughts we want your experience you know yeah 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 Love that. Um, Sarah, if people want to connect with you, if they want to reach out, find out more about what you do, what you offer to organisations, what's the best way they can do that? 
So my website is sarahcourtneycoaching.ie. Um, I've recently joined Instagram. I'm absolutely pulling on it, but I would love to hear from people <laughs> on Instagram. I don't even know my handle. It's, I, I think it's Sarah Courtney Coaching. <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of Instagram now whether or not it's uh, business wise it's good it's kind of more of behind the scenes for me yeah. I have to admit that it's yeah. not you know I want to help to educate people on the fact that there are these other opportunities I think from an individual perspective sometimes people are afraid to jump ship from an organisation where yeah. they're not happy because they think they won't find the level of flexibility that they currently have or that they won't find the same colleagues or you know there's all of these other things going on but um, for me it's about educating like how to be happier where you are or how to understand more about yourself and find something that really, really, really suits you. Absolutely. And I always say to somebody, if you're going to leave, OK, that's fine, but don't take the baggage with you. Yeah. You know, deal with whatever the challenge that you're face, facing is now. So if at a point in time you decide to go elsewhere, you're at the best version of yourself yeah, in the next absolutely. place. You're not, yeah. taking, you're not taking that imposter syndrome with you. You're not yeah. taking that... I couldn't hack it with you. Yeah. You know, chances are you're not an island and lots of other people were in the mix here. Yeah, exactly. uh, and it's not all on you to fix. Yeah. Um, the other way people can reach me, obviously, is LinkedIn. I'm, I'm yeah. probably most active on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. But Sarah Courtney, you'll find me. I come up fairly, fairly <laughs> high on the Google searches because it's such a specific thing that I do. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Sarah, the question I ask everyone who comes mm. on the podcast, what makes you happier at work? So when I started the FIFA, I imagined what I wanted it to be. And that for me was work that had meaning, um, that I felt I was good at, that I could financially support my family and I'd have quality time with them. Mm. And that for me, and I've, I've done that. That's what I have. Yeah. The other piece I'd say is more specific and that I now build in space in my working life in my whole life so I don't go boom 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 meeting 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 um I used to go I uh, work a, a five morning HR job which in theory was priceless I mean it was the best thing ever um but I finished at one and my school pickup was at half one and I think it took me 29 minutes <laughs> yeah 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 so <laughs> it was no felt lunch. really back to back yeah I couldn't there couldn't be a, a red light um there was no time I used to have a job where I'd put the runners on under the desk at 25 past five and run to the dart <laughs> and collect my kids yeah and she was the last okay but, so this does not work for me happiness for me is thinking space yes it's yeah yeah buffer time yeah I think we all need that we and we underestimate how important it is to have that space to think throughout the day in this day and age of back-to-back -back meetings and you know even reducing meeting times from an hour to 45 minutes and even thinking about who really needs to be at this meeting and do I need to be at this meeting but if you're in a back-to-back -back meeting by five two, you're thinking about the next meeting. So you stepped out. So the, the focus isn't there. Yeah. And and my clients talk to me about productivity and time management. How can I get more done? And I'm like, are you doing the basics? Yeah. <laughs> do, do you take a lunch break? Are you drinking some water? Uh, do you stretch in the day? Like, are you doing anything to just not be on a hamster wheel? Because we think we're being efficient like that, but actually your brain is just burning out. It's like a battery on your laptop running down. It did, does not perform like that. Um, so happiness for me is definitely about being really disciplined with, like after this podcast recording, I'm walking my dog in the beautiful weather and then I'm back on with my client at 12. That's, that's my day. Um, and that's because that lets me show up as my best self, either at work or at home. I think that's one of the benefits I think for working for yourself is that you feel like you can do that but I think everyone should feel that opportunity that if mm -hmm. they don't have a meeting that they can go out in the middle of the day and not ha not have the expectation of being available on instant messenger not having the expectation of replying immediately to an email you know so it's I, I see it as permission to being successful that's what I see it and yeah. success for me is building a buffer time of 15 minutes well, I'm going to make sure I'm responsible for doing that. I'm not going to wait until somebody says it's OK um, or ask permission necessarily. Uh, you know, I'm going to show up as my professional self. Yeah. 
hitting my targets, doing whatever it is I'm meant to be doing in a way that is supportive of me being able to do that. Yeah. And chances are it's not sitting and staring at a screen for eight hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like even stepping away from the laptop to, yeah. you know, put a pen and paper and actually write down your thoughts. To what, like what's going on? What's coming up for me? Yeah. We kind of digressed slightly. I know, I know. <laughs> but really interesting all the same. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Sarah. I really, really enjoyed this conversation and it's definitely been long overdue and I was delighted to have it with you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Aoife. It was an absolute pleasure. That was Sarah Courtney from Sarah Courtney Coaching and I really hope you enjoy that conversation as much as I did. I thought Sarah had some wonderful insights to share, which I'm going to summarise now in a minute. But first, I'll let you in on a little secret. This is my second time to record this summary. I was being very organised and I recorded the intro and the summary to this episode before I went on holidays and somehow managed to delete the file or I didn't download it properly or there's typically never enough space on my laptop. So any advice around that that anyone has would be really great. Anyway, moving back to today's episode and summarising the key points, I would love if you could get involved in the conversation that I usually would have either on Instagram, happieratwork.ie or over on LinkedIn. I go live on LinkedIn every week as well, either by myself or with my podcast guest. So I will be going live to discuss this week's episode. If you have any specific questions you want answered, feel free to connect with me over there. In terms of what we spoke about, we did cover a lot of ground. And as I mentioned, I think a few times, this is a topic I have been meaning to talk about for quite some time now and one of my lovely listeners got in touch, reached out to me and asked me to cover this topic. So I'm so glad to be able to answer her question that she had. We started the conversation by talking about the fact that it's typically the impact of the mother of the breaks that are taken at work but also be really careful not to label it because it's not just women, it's not just mothers, it's really the impact of a massive transition of anyone who's taking an absence from work, be that an illness absence, traveling, as in my case, any, you know, it could be paternity either as well. It could be caring responsibilities. And there is no one size, one size fits all solution. And that is typical of a lot of solutions that it really needs to be this personalized approach and taking that on, on an individual basis, on a one to one basis as well. Sarah mentioned some research conducted by DCU. I'm going to see if I can get my hands on that research. And if I can, then I will put that in the show notes as well. We talked about the fact that it's, it's it's slightly nuanced in that we're not necessarily communicating that it's a struggle because we see that as some sort of flaw, some sort of a weakness. So we're not saying that we're having a problem transitioning back to the workplace. We mentioned as well the gender pay gap. If you haven't listened to my podcast episode on the gender pay gap and pay in general, then do go back and have a listen to that. But it is a huge contributing factor to the gender pay gap. And as a quick reminder, the gender pay gap is not about the differentials being paid to men and women at the same level. It's more about the overall gap in what men on average are being paid versus what women on average are being paid, which is driven largely by the fact that there are fewer women in those more senior positions. And taking those big chunks out of work tends to drive that in terms of salary, in terms of fewer leadership opportunities in terms of less visibility for women in the workplace. The other thing that Sarah mentioned and I thought was quite interesting was that young women are quietly watching. So in an organisation, they may not be planning to have children immediately, but if they see that it's an organisation that supports families, that supports that type of approach, and if that's something that they're planning themselves, then it's something that they will likely stay in the organisation for longer. Sarah also mentioned about this idea of professional identity and having that professional identity of wanting to go back to work. So in Germany, there's an option to take three years, but sometimes people don't want to take that full amount of time and it can be a real struggle between the professional versus the personal identity. We spoke about the lived versus the policy. So it's all well and good to have a policy that talks about 
the options that are available or the policies that you have in place. But is that the actual lived experience of the people in the organisation? And that's definitely worth bearing in mind. And what springs to mind for me is a book that I listened to on audio by Alex Sujon Kim called Shorter. And in it, he talks about There's all of these companies that have the flexible working options, but actually people are very reluctant to take up those flexible working options because it's seen as something like you're not as committed to the job. So I think it was some statistic like four or five percent of people taking up those flexible working options because of the perception. So there's one thing to have the policy in place, but there's another thing for the lived experience of what people are actually doing and the behaviour that it drives. We spoke about culture as well and this idea of eye rolling. So mentioning that you have to go and collect kids, whether it could be in the morning, could be in the evening and then people eye rolling. So kind of moving away from that type of culture. We spoke about the responsibility of large organisations to be spearheading these types of new policies, these these new ways of working, which I think is a really, really great approach. We spoke about managing conflict at work and the fact that energy is not endless. And when we use up a lot of energy in the daytime with conflict, whether that's hiding what's going on for ourselves or dealing with issues with other people at work, then that takes up an an awful lot of our energy and the work doesn't necessarily get done. We spoke about meeting needs at work. And if you've listened to this podcast for a while, you know that I'm all about meeting needs. Like for me, that is a key driver of happiness at work is making sure that people's needs are being met at an individual level. But you can do that at scale. If you want to talk to me more about that, I am open to discussion. Do get in touch. In keeping with the theme for International Women's Day this year, we talked about the concept to break the bias and just because we've always done something a certain way doesn't mean that we necessarily need to continue doing that and oftentimes because we've done something a certain way we don't see that there's another way to do things so keeping an open mind around changing how things have always been done I love this concept of teeing myself up for success so how can I be the change and how can I be the one who is successful and how can I empower myself to be successful at work? Oftentimes as well, it's not just about something being broken. It can be just being a little bit better. So think about what can we do a little bit better? And in response to asking questions of employees, telling them that they're actually being listened to and taking action on what it is that they're saying. Now, one really interesting thing about the discussion with Sarah was it's not all about doom and gloom. It's not all bad news stories. And actually, there were some several good news stories that she had to share. So someone was promoted during maternity leave. Uh, Another had really great supportive teams around them as well, like checking in and things like that. Another had a great manager. Another was thriving since they're back at work. So it's not all just, you know, going back and finding it a really difficult transition. Sometimes people thrive after having that break. And also don't discount that people can learn new skills especially if they're new into the role of mother or father. They can learn these new skills, you know, multitasking, um, balancing act, prioritisation, all of this kind of stuff. The other thing that we touched on was this idea of mommy guilt and the idea, I suppose, and, and something that we spoke about actually after we stopped recording was the the feeling that we should be guilty by going back to work. And this, you know, if people ask, will you feel guilty going back to work? It sort of perpetuates this idea of the mommy guilt. So moving away from asking those types of questions and and focusing more on the positives of returning to work. Stay tuned for next week. I will have another solo podcast episode and I will chat to you then. That was another episode of the Happier at Work podcast. I am so glad you tuned in today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I would love to get your thoughts. Head on over to social media to get involved in the conversation. If you enjoy the podcast, I would love if you could rate, review it or share it with a friend. If you want to know more about what I do or how I could help your business, head on over to happieratwork.ie.